Hi, this is Dr. Erickson coming to you from California. Uh, we're pleased to have a guest with us on today that I believe is going to really shed some light on herd immunity. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Obitovsky, and he is has a master's in biostatistics. He is a PhD in computer science, and he has a doctor of science in uh, medical biometry. And thank you for coming on the, uh, the Zoom meeting today. Thank you for having me. I, would you please tell us, uh, I think a lot of people would like to know, is there a difference between flu and COVID from your experience? Let me, before I'm answering this, let me make two statements because I'm currently being thrown dirt at. First is, I never claimed to have been a professor at Rockefeller University, although I was there for 20 years. And I have a company that is producing drugs for age-related conditions including a drug to reduce the severity of COVID. Okay. So now I can answer your question. I don't think that there is a fundamental difference between COVID and flus. I, it may be that some more elderly people dying with COVID and some more younger people dying with some of the flus, but that, that is a gradual difference. All flus are different, but there's no fundamental difference. Could you, could you speak to herd immunity and what you've seen over your 35 years of experience? And are we taking the right approach? And would you uh, recommend us looking at maybe Sweden or some other countries and getting some, some input for how they're handling the crisis? With very few exceptions, and one was a hundred years ago, right after the First World War, when there was no antibiotics around. But ever since then, flus do exactly the same thing. They come for two weeks, they peak, and they go for two weeks. And if you leave them alone, it's over after five weeks or even less. And what we have seen in China, in Wuhan, originally, and then in South Korea, and in the meantime in Austria, and in Australia, and in many other places is exactly that. If you leave the flu run its natural course, it will do whatever, what all flus have done for the last uh, hundreds of years. They come and they go, and nothing much happens, except some people die, and that is um, regrettable. We don't like that, but that is how life is. So do you, do you think that we should have gone into a, a social isolation lockdown uh, in, in, in America? Do you think that was the best strategy initially? And then do you think it's the best strategy now? It was, we already knew from the experience in China and South Korea when it came to Europe, and when it came to the United States, we even had the European experience that told us that this is a flu, and we have never shut down uh, the life for the flu, and it is, in fact, dangerous. One thing is the old people and those with comorbidities are at high risk. You can isolate them over a short period of time, but if you flatten the curve as people try to do. You're prolonging the time people need to isolate, and that is very difficult to do. So in the end, you have more deaths, not only from suicides and um, other for, uh, consequences of depression uh, and aggression, but you also have more death among the elderly simply because the isolate, isolation is less effective. Now, they have put a lot of weight on a vaccine, and we have a vaccine for influenza. Could you talk to us about the effectiveness of the vaccine for influenza and what you think, how effective you think a vaccine will be for herd immunity for COVID-19? Okay, uh, vaccines are one of the strategies of creating herd immunity. The other strategy is just getting the flu, getting over it, and be done with it. And in the majority of people, it's as severe as the vaccination is. They don't even know that they get it. So herd immunity is something, a natural process by which respiratory 
diseases are limited and we don't really need to do much about it. We can enhance it a bit with the vaccine if the vaccines are effective. With flu, the vaccines are not that great. It may help a bit, yes, but it doesn't make a much of a difference. Well, you make a key point because I was just reading on the CDC Today website and they said, you know, some years the vaccine has little to no effect. And I quote, little to no effect. And I, I've been, you know, uh, treating patients for a, a many, many years. And uh, just because you have a vaccine, a lot of times 40 to 50 percent of the population won't take it. And of those who take it, it works in about 30 percent of the time. So well, the problem is that every virus that spreads is a new virus. Otherwise, it wouldn't spread. And if it's a new virus, we don't have a va good vaccine against it. We may have vaccines against similar viruses that have something that's called cross immunity, so they may help a bit, but uh, it is not something that is, per it's not like the smallpox where we knew we have a vaccine that uh, deals with the disease. And if you take the vaccine, you don't get the disease. Uh, with flus, it's never the case like that. So when we look at uh, Sweden compared to us, I was listening to their, their chief of epidemiology and he's doing some interviews and they went for a strategy of all kids uh, under 16 are in school, businesses are still functioning, people are doing a little bit of social distancing, they're isolating in their homes, they went sort of more of a hybrid approach instead of a full close down. Do you think that's a good strategy? I think it's a very good strategy. Uh, and what we have seen in Sweden is not the disaster that people have uh, expected there. Uh, they are doing pretty well. Maybe they have a few more infections than the neighboring Denmark or Norwich, Nor Norway, but we will know that only in the end because we don't know if it's just a shift. But even if the number of cases should be 20% higher in Sweden than in Norway, uh, there is no, that is nothing compared to the devastating effects that the shutdown of society and economy has. So you're, you're saying the collateral damage is essentially more significant than the actual disease from the virus. Yes. That's fascinating. Uh, one one uh, numbers I look at is death per million, and I compared... Uh, Sweden has 200 deaths per million. Italy and Spain both have in the 400 deaths per million. Italy and Spain are in tight lockdown and Sweden is not. So I'm inclined to think that maybe a, an approach close to Sweden that doesn't absolutely tank our economy uh, is probably at this point a better strategy than fully locking us down. I wouldn't compare Sweden to Italy and Spain because Italy and Spain had a very bad epidemic for reasons that we don't really understand yet. But Sweden wasn't much better than the United States right. or other countries who had just uh, were in the middle of the ballpark. Yeah, so I, I think one of the key things I'm focusing on is if we had not done a lockdown, do you think our herd immunity would have spiked and come down by now? Yes, uh, the duration of the epidemic would have been much shorter and we should have done something that in the United States was missed an opportunity. I don't know why politicians missed that. We knew from Italy that the elderly are at a particularly high risk. And then we saw very early on in February, end of February in Seattle, that there was that a lot of people in one nursery nursing home died and that should have been a red flag and we should have closed all nursing homes in the united states to uh, pay the nurses and other personal overtime so that they can stay for three or four weeks with the people and let nobody get into the nursing home. And this would have prevented thousands of deaths. It would have been much more effective than the potentially counter 
effective closure of schools. Now, I heard your, I heard your uh, interview on China, and you went through the data and revealed that February 6th, I believe it was, is when China peaked, and then it came right back down, and they, they imposed measures to lock down on the 21st, if I recall the data. So they, well, they the, had, first, the first lock, lockdown, as it's called, was they just isolated the city of Wuhan, but they did not force people to stay at home. So life within Wuhan went on almost as it was before. They just closed the railroad and the highways leading out of Wuhan. And that has, the virus doesn't care. Now I noticed that you had also mentioned that the pandemic is over in China, no new cases reported. Do you, are, do you think the, the, the data coming out of China is accurate? Well, we have seen satellite images uh, during the epidemic showing uh, that streets were empty and uh, the ho hospitals were built and there was a huge drama. And now we don't see anything of that. So obviously it's not so bad, as bad as it was. And then we also have seen South Korea. And whatever you think about China, I think South Korea is a country that has a lot more credibility here. And there we have seen an epidemic like every other epidemic. And South Korea, the government was very proud never to have shut down the country, never to have imposed things to people that would run counter the concept of democracy. Uh, so they gave recommendations, and then what we saw in South Korea indicates that people followed this, these recommendations to some extent, because after we saw the epidemic peak and go back, there were for three weeks, there was kind of a tail where we had small number of cases per day, and that lasted for about three weeks. And that is what we would expect if we don't have herd immunity yet, uh, it takes some time for herd immunity to build. And once there is herd immunity, and that was for a week ago or two weeks ago, I forgot when it was, uh, the numbers go down and the epidemic is over. Let me, let me uh, transition to testing here real quick. I, my centers, I have seven medical centers. We've done about 6,000 tests. They're the nasal pharyngeal swabs, the PCR test. We have about 413 positives, which is about 7%. Now, Stanford uh, did their study with the antibodies. They did 3,300, and they had about a 2.5 to 4.16% positive rate. So they were estimating uh, public health recorded 956 cases, and they're saying there's somewhere between 50 and 80,000 in Santa Clara. We're estimating 7% of 900,000 people. So we're seeing 50 to 80 times the number of people who have had positive COVID than the health departments are predicting. What is your take on testing? Do we need to do it? Do we not need to do it? Okay, the first thing is to differentiate between virus testing and antibody testing. Virus testing tells you whether you currently are infected. Antibody testing tells you whether you have been infected. The virus testing for an epidemiologist is not so important. It may be important for a clinician but I'm not even sure there because if you have somebody coming in with respiratory problems, you're probably not testing first, you are treating first. Am I correct? Yes. Uh, good. So the antibody tests are important for the epidemiologist because it tells us how many people are already immune. These tests have been done in Germany. They have been done in Sweden. They have been done in the United States, in New York. And just to name three, and in all three cases, the data are consistent with about 25% of people being immune. And that means we have already, we're, we went a long way towards herd immunity. And even if we would shut down today, and uh, shut down the, shut down, I mean, open up everything today, uh, the rebound, if there should be a rebound, would be very low, uh, would be nothing compared to what we already have seen. So there's no, nothing to fear. Let me ask you about reopening. You mentioned that. Now, 
a state like New York, where you, the, the state of New York, uh, an entire state is 19.4 million. And they're in like New York City, they're really close together. Where I live in Kern County, we have 900,000 people. And it's one of the biggest counties in California. Everyone's spread out. We drive cars. We don't ride the subway. So if you were, if they said, doctor, how would you open up New York and how would you op open up California? Would you have a same or a different strategy? I think what you see, uh, you now go to Montana, where it takes uh, three hours to drive to, uh, to your next neighbor. There you already have some sorts of separation. And um, so, yes, things are different in different places. I don't think that there is much of a difference as far as the consequences are concerned. I think if you have a, it's, if it's closely populated like New York, you can get very high spikes. In a country that is not closely populated, you will never have such a high spike because it takes more time for the virus to travel from one place to the next. So I think there is no reason uh, anywhere in the United States to say, well, we need to continue with this uh, second prohibition. So when you look at the data, do you have a gestalt? I know we, don't, we haven't had enough testing, but do you have a gestalt as to kind of the percentage of people that have immunity uh, across the country? I think in the more densely populated places, it uh, seems to be 25%. In the less densely populated places, it may be 10%. Um, and that is enough for, the play, for whatever the place is. So I don't see any particular reason to say we have to continue the lockdown here and not there. The high risk places have high levels of immunity, the lower risk levels have low levels of immunity, and the end, that's fine. So would you say it's, it's appropriate to sort of start with the schools? I just, I want to get specific on this because I know I'm, I'm meeting with uh, a bunch of senators tomorrow in California, and they're going to ask me specifically. So if we're going to open up California, should we start with the schools, you know, under 16, let them go back and kind of gauge the disease process, and more importantly, the if, if the hospitals start becoming stacked and overwhelmed, should we pull back? Should we go slow like that? Kind of give us a sense of how you would open up California. Uh, my cons I also had these concerns in the beginning. Um, my suggestion would also have been to undo what should never have been done before, and that was closing the schools. So the first step should be opening schools as soon as possible, as the scientific advisory board for the German government told the German government, it's the Leopoldina. Uh, so that it, schools should be opened immediately. Would I wait, now that we have seen that the more densely populated areas have already uh, sufficient levels of herd immunity or moving towards herd immunity, I think we could, should just open everything. I don't see any reason to wait any longer. Okay. Well, that's, that's helpful. Uh, and I, I, think, I think getting that message out there is clear because I think uh, a lot of the people that I hear talking oftentimes are pointing out the problem without giving a, a clear path to the solution. So that's actually very helpful for me. Uh, to let them know what, what experts that are analyzing the mathematical data behind this are saying. So that's really helpful. Um, that, that answers a lot of my questions. Uh, I, do you mind if I quote you uh, when I go on these national media syndicates? Not at all. I'd okay. be happy to provide. I think that is one opportunity and obligation that we have as scientists uh, to reach out to politicians, even if they don't like to talk to scientists, to say we have something to say and there are things we can provide that could help and prevent further damage from being done. Okay, well, I, that's, that's all I have for you. I think you've been really concise in getting to the point. I appreciate your time and your efforts and your experience. It's actually been very helpful for me. I've watched your video multiple times 
and I appreciate it. So thank you for making time for me. Thank you for having me. All right, have and a good day. Call whenever you need some more information. I'll be happy to answer any question you may have. Okay, thank you, doctor. Have a good day. You too.